Om Ajnana Tamarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Anchakalpa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhevacha Patita Nam Bhavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namo Namaha Very good. Because what we're going to be talking about today, what Narada is going to be talking about now in the Narada Bhakti Sutras, in his book, is the highest example of bhakti. You remember, if you remember, the last time that we were together, he gave several examples of what is bhakti in accordance with various different sages, Vyasa, Shandilya, etc. Well, now he's going to be talking about the very highest example of bhakti. And this is what we'll be focusing on for, for several verses. You remember also I mentioned how in the Narada Bhakti Sutras, these verses are grouped in sections of like a few verses. It can be three verses, five verses, where there's a thought that's carried through for several verses, a theme. Well, now we're going to meet a, another one of these themes, but this is an extremely important one. It is, again, the example of the highest Shuddha Bhakti, the highest form of pure devotion that exists. And it is, for those who don't know what this is, it's so surprising to the reader that Narada even has to explain what he means by this, as we'll see. Why is it that these people are considered to be the highest representations of bhakti? Before I even go into this, who would you think would be, as a grouping of individuals, the highest examples of bhakti? Would you expect Narada to talk about a grouping of acharyas, a grouping of very advanced yogis, a grouping of, of siddhas, of, of very, again, advanced yogis or something like that? It's not who he speaks of. Not scholars, not philosophers. Instead, let's see what Narada actually says here. So, we will begin with chapter 2, verse 21. The gopis, that is, cowherd women, cowherd girls, really. The gopis of Vrindavana are an example of pure devotional consciousness. An example of pure devotional consciousness. Now, who are these people? We've heard this term, I think most of us, not everyone probably, we've heard this term gopi. There's the correspondence, the, the masculine gopa, gopa. A gopa or gopi, these are individuals who live a very humble lifestyle. These are individuals who are protectors and caretakers of cows, of cattle. Now, let's keep in mind Krishna's story. Krishna, of course, is the avatar. He is God. He is the source of all reality. What to speak of a great person? No. He's not merely a great person. He's not merely a teacher. He's not merely the greatest of kings, etc., etc., which he was also all that as well, of course. He was the greatest of teachers. He's the Adi Guru. He teaches the uh, Bhagavad Gita. He was the greatest of kings as the king of Dwaraka, etc., etc. He was the greatest person in every sense. This is why he was all attractive, and all people were attracted to him, not just people. All beings were attracted to him. He was all of these things, but he was God. He was the avatar. But, of course, in this particular descent of God, as this avatar, Krishna, his story is that he ends up as a child in Vrindavana. Vrindavana is a beautiful place, approximately 90 miles or so south of present-day New Delhi. But the predominant, let's say, pastime for the inhabitants of Vrindavana 52 or so hundred years ago was that they took care of cows. They were cattle people. Not in the same sense that we have cattle people today, of course. When we think of cattle people, we think of people who raise cattle to be butchered and to be killed and eaten. We think of Texas and large cattle ranches with thousands of heads, quote-unquote, heads of cattle going through, etc. These were not the sort of cattle people that the inhabitants of Vrindavana were. On the contrary, they were Gopala. 
They were protectors of the cow. Go means cow, Pala means protector. They protected the cow. They raised cow, the cows. They certainly used their milk. They took the milk from the cows very gently, very lovingly, in uh, mutual cooperation with the cows. And from that milk, they, of course, made everything, yogurt and ghee and butter and so many wonderful things that they would then sell or barter, etc. But this was their lifestyle, the inhabitants of Vrindavana. Thus, Krishna himself, living in Vrindavana, even though Varna-wise, he was a Kshatriya, even though spiritually-wise, he was God, he also played the role, the Leela, the play role of a Gopa. So he also loved the cows. And who were his friends? His friends were the Gopas and the Gopis. The Gopas being his male friends who he literally hung out with and played, and they would play tag and run through the forest in Vrindavana and do all sorts of things. But also these girls who were there, known as the gopis, the female protectors of the cows. Thus, when Narada Muni says that this is an example, these gopis are an example of pure shuddha bhakti, of pure devotional consciousness, this is who he is talking about. Now, Again, this would be maybe surprising to some. You would expect that Narada would say, oh, such and such, you know, this group of yogis or acharyas or gurus or somebody, this is the perfect example. But no, he talks about these gopis. Why? Why is this the case? Well, who are these gopis, number one? We need to understand the, the long history of who these individuals are. Because even though in this particular context, 52 or so hundred years ago, they were in the form of young girls, and we're talking about young, you know, 13, 14, 15, 16, they were teenagers. Who were they in their previous life? In their previous life, they were indeed great yogis. In fact, so much so that the story is, and I won't go very deep into this, just extremely brief. In their previous life, they were indeed yogis, forest yogis living in the forest, and they encountered Rama, previous incarnation, much, much, much earlier than Krishna. There were these yogis, a whole group of them, a whole bunch of them, 108 of them, who were in this forest practicing yoga, doing their tapasya, living what to me at least is the perfect lifestyle, living in nature, deep, deep in the forest, and just meditating and practicing yoga and living in accordance with nature and feeding the deer and leading a beautiful, gentle life. These were like rishis, except they were practicing yogis. And as they were there, Rama, in his exile, Rama, Lakshmana, and Sita came through. And these yogis are stirred from their meditation, and they look upon Rama, and he also was an incarnation of God. But again, this was much before, before Krishna, many, many lifetimes before Krishna. And even though the majority of these yogis were male, they fell in love with Rama. Because again, this is God. When I say fell in love, I don't mean in an earthly sense. I mean they became enamored by his beauty, by his grace, by everything that he was, by his effulgence to the point where they began, they all came to Rama, and they began to pray to him, and they began to ask him, Rama, you are what we have been meditating for. We understand this. You are God. All of our lives we have been meditating upon you within our hearts, but now we open our eyes, and you are here before us. We want to be with you. We want to be with you, and be with you constantly, never leaving your side. And Rama explains after giving him, giving them his blessings, he explains, I know, I understand, but this is not your destiny in this life. Instead, be patient. Continue with what you are doing. You will achieve liberation, and in your next life you will come to know me, but you will be girls. You will be young girls known as the gopis. And then, when I come back as Krishna, you can be with me. That's who these gopis are. That's who these gopis are. So now we come forward in time, many, many, many thousands of years, and now Krishna is here. And again, there are these girls who are teenagers, 13, 14, 15, 16 years old. And as we know, having looked at the scriptures, 
Everything has importance. Everything has meaning, and often meaning compounded upon meaning, compounded upon meaning, compounded upon meaning. Why? Why did this have to happen? Why did Rama say this to these yogis? Why did they have to come back as not just yogis again? They couldn't even come back as men. They had to come back as women. They had to come back as girls. They had to come back not just as girls, but as gopis. Not girls who were great scholars, not brahmanas, not kshatriyas, but really vaishyas. What in the Varna system is considered a little bit lowly, even class-wise. What is, why? What is the purpose of all this? The significance is amazing. When we look at the gopis, and believe me, even as deep as it seems that I'm going, I'm barely scratching the surface of the significance of who these gopis are and what the significance of them is. This was to prove a point. This was to prove the extremity of the nature of bhakti, that it is such that devotion overrules all. Devotion overrules gender. Devotion overrules class. Devotion overrules scholasticism, being a scholar. Devotion overrules even being a yogi. You see, these gopis, purposefully, they didn't practice yoga. These were not girls who constantly in meditation or anything. No, they were, if you observe them, seemingly, seemingly, seemingly very normal. They played and they giggled and they milked the cows and they walked in the nature and they just did little things, which to our ordinary eyes would make us think these are just very ordinary little girls. But of course, we know from their past history, they're not. The fact that they're young is of significance because, of course, we place a lot of foolishness in youth very often. We think that, oh yes, to be wise you have to be old, you have to be an elderly person, you have to have been here for some time, but no, these are again 14, 15 year old girls. These are not brahmanas, these are not individuals who were born to be scholars, but rather they have a very ordinary profession, they milk cows, that's it. And yet, these people, despite all of these seemingly worldly obstacles, they show that bhakti is of such a force that these worldly obstacles mean nothing. That bhakti literally overrules everything. And what we see is that with story after story after story, we see that these gopis had a love for Krishna that was unbounded. You see, everything that we can conceive of, for the most part, is bounded. Bound, bounded by something, some sort of borderline, some sort of constraint. But imagine a love, a bhakti, a devotion that has zero constraint. And when I say zero, I mean zero to the point where it is beyond even religiosity in the normative sense of that term. A love that is beyond beyond even what is seemingly appropriate in polite society. Let me explain what I mean by this by telling a story and then you'll start to get precisely how unbounded and unconditional was the love for these gopis. So this is the story and this comes from the Shastra, this comes from the Vedic literature. So one day Krishna, and this was much later when he was a king in Dvaraka, and he was no longer living in Vrindavana. But one day Krishna was in his palace and something very strange happened. God had a headache. <laughs> very strange, no? What does it mean for God to have a headache? Does God get headaches? No, of course not. But you see, God has Leela, he has pastimes. He will do things to, sh to show us something. So in this particular case, Krishna has a headache <laughs> and he's lying on his bed, holding his head and everyone is so concerned. His servants are there, so many people are there, family members, and he just can't even move. And they're all asking him, Krishna, what is wrong? What is wrong? And he says, oh, I just have this terrible headache and I just can't do anything. I can't even open my eyes. I can't get up out of bed. I can't do anything. My head is just pounding. 
And they all ask him, of course, they love him. So all these servants and everyone, Krishna, what can we do? What can we do? Is there something? Do you want water? Is there some, uh, should we bring a doctor? What should we do? How can we help you with this headache? Of course, what is this? This is their bhakti. This is them expressing their devotion to Krishna. You see, that's the central thread throughout all of this. Krishna doesn't have a headache. And there is no cure for what cannot be. The important thing is the love. You see, Krishna feigns a headache in order to exhibit love. That's the thread. All right. So, of course, they're asking, what can we do? What can we do? And he says, oh, there's nothing. Nothing can be done. No, don't bring a doctor. I know. I know. No doctor can help me. No doctor can help me. Really? There's only one thing that can help me. Only one thing. There's only one thing that can help me. I need you to find my greatest devotees, those people who truly love me, and you need to ask them for the dust from their feet. Take, get that from them. Bring that to me. And if I put that on my head, I know that will immediately get rid of the headache. So, of course, I think you understand. In every culture, you know, the feet are considered very lowly. They touch the ground. And, you know, to take the dust from someone's feet and then put it on the head of God, oh, that's, that's blasphemous, that's sacrilege, that's a, a horrible insult. But yet Krishna is saying that's the only thing that will help him. Now, keep in mind, the people he's talking to, they're his devotees too, they love him. But when he says this to them, they just kind of look at each other. Uh, all right, well, Krishna, are you sure that that's what you need? Yes, that is the only thing. If I can have the dust from the feet of my pure devotees and put that on my head, I'll have relief. And they look at each other again. And, well, um, Krishna, we're your devotees, but we, we can't do that. We can't even conceive of such a thing. Take the dirt from our feet and put it on your head. We can't do it. All right, well, well can you search for someone who can? Udhava, Udhava. You're a great devotee of mine. Uh, can I have the dust from your feet? No, Krishna, no. <laughs> All right, Udhava, I'm going to give you this task. You go out and search for my greatest devotees and ask them for the dust from their feet. Well, that I'll do. All right, Krishna, <laughs> I'll go and do that. And he leaves on his chariot. And he goes and he searches and he goes to yogis. And he goes to a group of, of yogis sitting, and they greet him, and he tells them the situation. Oh, Krishna has a horrible headache, and we don't know what to do. And he's told us that if we can get the dust of the feet of his devotees, and he puts that on his head, that will heal him. Can I, do you mind? No! <laughs> They're horrified. The dust from my feet? No! And he goes to, again, another great devotee, another great person. He goes to a rishi and on and on, to make a long story short. And finally, of course, he makes his way all the way to Vrindavana. And there he finds the gopis. And the gopis see him and immediately they're in ecstatically happy and they run to him because they know he's Krishna's servant. And they begin to ask him a million questions. How is our Lord? How is Krishna? How is he doing? What does he look like? What did he do today? Tell us everything about him. What was he wearing today? Is he, does he still wear peacock feathers on his head? What? Tell us, tell us. And he conversed with them for a little while. And then he told them the same thing. Well, I do have bad news. Krishna has a horrible headache. And that's why I'm here. I've been searching and searching and searching. And he says, only one thing will cure him. What is it? What? What will cure him? <laughs> they ask him. Well, he says, if he can get some of the dust from the feet of his purest devotees and put that on his head, that will cure him. And I've asked so many people, and no one will do that. They're scared to death that it would be sacrilegious. And even though they're great devotees, they won't do it. And the gopis look at each other. <laughs> they grab dust from their feet. Here, here, take it. Get this to Krishna immediately. Give this to him. We have to heal him. We have to cure him now. And Uddhava is, is, is amazed. Really? And he's holding this dust and he puts it in a little bag. Well, thank you. Thank you. Oh, 
but can I ask you, why are you so, so eager to do this? Don't you know this is sacrilegious? This, this is God, and you know this. this it is our, it's our custom to take dust from your feet, put it on the head of God. This would almost uh, ensure a, a hellish existence for you, horrible karma, etc. Why are you so willing to do this? And they look at him puzzled. You don't understand? This is our love. This is our beloved. We would be in hell for eternity if it would make him happy for one moment. And then, at that point, Uddhava understood. These are the greatest devotees. That is true selflessness in devotion. And right there he offered his obeisances to these little girls. And he touched their feet for their blessings, knowing that these were greater than the greatest of all yogis, the greatest, greater than the greater of all acharyas, all gurus, because they had true shuddha bhakti, pure devotion, with no sense of self, no sense of me, just what? My Lord is in pain, I will do whatever is necessary to alleviate that pain. Such is the nature of the gopis. So this is who we're talking about, are the gopis. These were childhood companions of Krishna. They were, Krishna was their beloved. They, they loved Krishna in every way, as friend, as conjugal lover, as servant, as everything. To them, all that existed was Krishna. We hear this term, Krishna consciousness, sometimes. Krishna Chaitanya, Krishna Consciousness, Consciousness of Krishna. The gopis exhibited what is meant by Krishna Consciousness. In everything that they saw, they saw Krishna. In everything that they heard, they heard Krishna. When they heard in the forests of Vrindavana, when they heard birds singing in their mind, they thought, they would think that, no, I'm hearing the flute of Krishna as he is playing his flute. When wind would come and blow upon their hair, they thought to themselves, no, that is the loving breath of Krishna blowing upon me. And in every way, they were conscious only of God, only of Krishna at all times. These are the gopis. And that consciousness of God, that... <laughs> The Vedantic term, Brahma Vidya, that God consciousness, is the perfection of all yoga. Thus, this is why, again, Narada Muni says this, that these gopis are the example of pure devotional consciousness. Now, let's go on to the next verse, verse 22. Even with the example of the gopis, one cannot criticize them by claiming that they temporarily forgot their innate awareness of God's greatness. Now, this is kind of a puzzling verse, unless you know the story of the gopis and uh, their relationship with Krishna. Their relationship with Krishna was a radically intimate one. And the culmination of this is something that happens called the Rasa Lila, the Rasa Lila dance. And who has heard of this before? The Rasa Lila. Please raise your hand. Okay, only a few people. The Rasa Lila is a famous event that occurs with Krishna and the gopis. And you see images of it depicted sometimes, where it is almost like a mandala. And the truth of the matter is, it is the highest of mandalas. Where at one point, and again, I'm taking something that's very complex and just trying to make it very brief. At one point, there was one evening where Krishna goes deep into the forest of Vrindavana, and it's very late at night, and all that there is is the moonlight, and everything is beautiful and wonderful. And one by one, just stirred from their own consciousness, the gopis, wherever they find themselves, they all wake up and they all come one by one. They all meet Krishna deep in the forests of Vrindavana. And there are 108 of them. 
and all together they begin to dance with Krishna. And this is a famous dance called the Rasa Lila dance. And Krishna is in the center with Radharani. Radha was also a gopi, but she is the chief gopi. So when we look on the altar and we see Radha Krishna, Radha, of course, is eternal. Radha has always been there. But in this particular pastime, she also is the chief of the gopis. She's the eld eldest of the gopis. And she and Krishna are in the center dancing. And all the gopis form circles around Radha Krishna. And they also are dancing around them, dancing around them. So you can imagine Radha Krishna in the center and all the gopis dancing around them like this. And this dance went on for a long time. And it is considered to be the summum bonum, the most important, highest, you could say almost symbolic representation of reality in its highest spiritual sense. That's the symbology behind this Rasa Lila dance with Radha Krishna and the gopis dancing around them. That's why you see this depicted so often. What is the point of this? Well, this is spiritually reality, that Radha Krishna are in the center and all of reality is dancing around them in ecstasy. That's what this symbolizes. But this actually occurred one night over 5,000 years ago in Vrindavana to symbolize for us what is our goal in life? What is this world all about? Philosophy, you know, what is philosophy? What is this all about? What is this world all about? What, what's the meaning of it all? And of course, an unlimited number of philosophers can speculate for an unlimited number of years and never even coming close to what ultimately, spiritually, in the truly spiritual context, life is all about. And what is life all about? Just that, having the Godhead in the center, this dual Godhead, Sriman Narayana Radha Krishna, in the center of our reality, in the center of our consciousness, such that they are really all that exists within the purview of our perception and our consciousness. And we ourselves, as their devotees, as their servants, are simply dancing around God in our own ecstasy, in our own adoration. That's what it's about. That is the highest culmination of philosophy, is a dance, a dance of love. So, all this being said, the reason why Narada says this, and let me just read this again to remind people, because again, it's kind of a strange verse unless you understand the context. Even with this example of the gopis, one cannot criticize them by claiming that they temporarily forgot their innate awareness of God's greatness. You see, just like with that previous story of where they, the gopis really did not follow proper Vedic decorum, Proper Vedic decorum is that you don't take dust from your feet. And imagine taking dust from your feet, placing it on, on the head of the murti. Oh, you wouldn't do that. But yet the gopis' love was so great that they went even against decorum. So some people throughout history have criticized and said, Oh, how can these people be great spiritual, spiritual people when they obviously forgot that God is God? They were treating Krishna, treat, treating God as if he was just one of them. And Narada is explaining here, no, they didn't. No, they didn't. You cannot criticize them for such a thing. At all moments, they were aware of who Krishna was. Because you see, again, even, even Uddhava was amazed, was perplexed, that they didn't even care about if they went to hell, just as long as they served Krishna and made Krishna happy. One would think that, well, they must have forgotten that this was God. Because how would they choose to do such a thing? And Narada is explaining the most amazing thing. No, they understood that this is God. And still, even decorum, even Vedic custom, even doing things that were considered proper meant nothing to them, as long as it's pleased Krishna. So again, for some people, it would confuse them. Well, how could they do that knowing this was God? You see, knowing that... Let me just give a completely off-the-wall example. 
knowing that here is God in front of you, if God says, it would please me tremendously if you were to just kind of take your finger and just kind of flick me on the side of the head. Who would do that, even if God himself is asking you? And if you were to indeed do that, wouldn't it be because, well, you must have forgotten it was God? Otherwise, how could you? You, you see the point? So Narada is saying, well, in the case of the gopis, no, they did not forget that this was God. Knowing that this was God, still nothing mattered to them but pleasing God. Even if it was, quote unquote, to the eyes of the normals, <laughs> that is, non-devotees, if it was an inappropriate thing to do. No, whatever God asks you, that's appropriate. Even if it seems bizarre to you, that yes, right now God wants you to take the dirt from your feet and put it on his head. He has asked you, thus you do it. He has asked you, thus, if no one else in their illusion can understand it, he knows what he's doing. And you see, in this case, he did, because he wanted to prove a point. You see, 5,000 years later, we're still, we are still telling the story, and you still feel the impact of it, the power of it. See, Krishna knew what he was doing, asking something bizarre. So again, this is really all that Narada is saying here. So let me just read this one more time. Even with this example of the gopis, one cannot criticize them by claiming that they temporarily forgot their innate awareness of God's greatness. No. They knew what they were doing, in other words. And they understood that it was, it was weird. They understood that it was going against what normal people would consider appropriate. But Krishna asked them. And their love for Krishna is so great that when Krishna asks you to do anything, you don't think to yourself, oh, but wait a minute, isn't there some verse somewhere in the Manava Dharma Shastra that says this is improper? And, well, I don't know, legally, uh, I'm not sure. No, this is Krishna asking you. And if he's asking you, it's for a reason. Because he is the source of all good. He is the source of all dharma, etc. All right. Let's go on to verse 23. And this is following the same vein, the same theme. If the gopis were devoid of the awareness of God's presence, their devotion would have been no different from the passion of illicit lovers. So, very interesting. Again, kind of saying the same thing, but in a different context. When the gopis, as young girls, teenagers, again, 13, 14, 15, 16 years old, when they are stirred from their sleep, from their slumber, and they're sleeping in their homes, their various homes, various contexts, and it's in the middle of the night, whatever time it is, midnight, one in the morning, whatever, and they get up out of bed, and all by themselves, they go off into a forest to meet with this seemingly young boy, quote-unquote, who is Krishna. That was improper. That's not a proper thing. If if you had a 14-year-old daughter, and suddenly, 1 o'clock in the morning, she gets up out of bed, and she disappears into the forest to go dance with some boy, well, you would not be very happy, would you? That would be a weird thing to do. That would be somewhat improper. But no, they knew what they were doing, and they understood that this was God who they were going to meet and to dance with. If they did not understand that, then yes, their actions would have been the same as just illicit lovers as just ordinary people who are just going to meet their boyfriend, you see? But Narada is explaining, no, that was not the case because they understood who this was. This wasn't some boyfriend or someone they're just going out to have fun with and do something crazy with, they're bored, no. They were dead asleep. They hear, they hear Krishna's flute. They wake up and they hear the flute and they understand this is God calling them. And almost besides themselves, they can't, they can't even help themselves. They just jump out of bed and they just disappear into the night, into the dark forest. And they just keep going deeper and deeper and deeper until finally there is this light. And it's the moon beaming down and lighting this beautiful grove. And there in the center are Radha and Krishna exhibiting their own light, their own effulgence. And one by one come all these 108 gopis. And they all begin to just dance with Radha Krishna, and they dance all throughout the night in bliss and in spiritual ecstasy. But again, 
seeing it from materialistic eyes, imagine you're the typical dad, the typical mom, and here goes your girl going running off in the middle of the forest. You would consider this bizarre. So again, to the eyes of ordinary people, this would seem strange. And Narada is explaining, if these gopis did not do this in God consciousness, then yes, it would be mistaken for some kind of illicit love. But Narada is explaining, that's not what it was. This was pure devotion, such that it even went against normal social customs and decorum. They didn't even care how it looked. If anyone did observe them, they didn't care. Yeah, let someone think I'm just running off with my boyfriend. Who cares? doesn't matter. I know what I'm doing, and I know who this is. So that's the point of this. Let me just actually read the, the last clause of verse 23, the verse that we just read. So had they not known that this was God, then their action would have been no different from the passion of illicit lovers. Okay. Now with that, we go to the next verse, because this is a, this is a continuation of that thought. So now verse 24. In such worldly passion, that is, of, of illicit lovers. So let's say this was just something materialistic. Yeah, they're just going off. Someone's just going off to meet their boyfriend. In such a worldly passion, one does not find one's happiness in witnessing the happiness of the beloved. So, in other words, what he's saying now is this is the nature of materialistic love, of worldly passion. So, with worldly passion, one does not find one's happiness in witnessing the happiness of the beloved. So, what is pure love? What is pure devotion? And certainly in the highest context, that is, with God as the beloved and we as the lover of the beloved, the, the lover of God, but really, even in love amongst each other, what is pure love, truly pure love? It means that when you see your beloved happy, you are happy. That's pure love. That's true love. That's real love. Again, not just in the highest context. Even if you have a pure love between two people in this world, that's the highest form of love. And of course, what we see is there is a variety of love. There's love, there's lust, there's all sorts of love. There's, there are things that we call love, whereas, whereas in actuality it's just selfish. The happiness of the other person is not what's forefront in your mind, but what you're getting from the relationship. You see, we're talking about material, material relationships. For most people, what is forefront, what is the most important thing in their awareness when they are in a relationship with someone else is, oh, what am I getting from this? What pleasure? What happiness? Am I be being given what I need? Am I being given attention? Am I being given all the things that I want to feel special, to feel important, to feel like, oh, yes, you know, I'm, look at me. Oh, I've got someone who loves me, et cetera, et cetera. Is it all just about me, 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 me? You see, that's the lowest form of so-called love. What to speak of just pure sexuality, where, oh, I'm with this person because, well, I just want to have sex with the person. That's beneath contempt. But what is considered true love? Again, not even necessarily in the highest spiritual context, even within this world. It is a love where, of course, it is not selfish, it is selfless. Why am I with this person? Because my love for this person is such that I am happy when they are happy. I have joy when they have joy, and that's why I'm with them, because it gives me joy to see a smile on their face. It gives me a joy to know that they're experiencing wonderful things. Oh, that's selfless love. That's pure love. So what Narada is saying here is that unless you have that, you won't have happiness. You will not understand happiness unless you have a love that is like that, that is selfless where the reason why you are in that relationship is, again, not just what am I getting from it, in even the subtlest of ways. Even just, oh, emotionally, yes, it's all about me. No. The way that we know happiness within the context of love is, when my beloved is happy, then I'm happy. And that's why I love this person. And that's why I'm in this relationship. That's the idea. So just so... We have the understanding. Let me read this verse just one more time. 
in such worldly passion, that is materialistic love, one does not find one's happiness in witnessing the happiness of the beloved. So he's explaining what is the nature, again, of materialistic love. In materialistic love, it's not the case that you are happy simply witnessing your beloved being happy. We'll go on to verse 25. But devotional consciousness, bhakti, is far superior to worldly activities, philosophical knowledge, or the practice of yoga. <laughs> Let me read this one more time. But devotional consciousness, you see, but, but devotional consciousness too. But, he's using this, this verse to contrast this with the previous verse. The previous verse, he's talking about materialistic love, materialistic lust, etc. And he's saying, but unlike that, devotional consciousness is far superior to worldly activities, all worldly activities, philosophical knowledge, or to the practice of yoga. How interesting. So again, this bhakti is indeed the highest good toward that which we, that we can attain. It is the samum bonum. It is the highest good, the highest thing attainable that we would want, that we can attain. That is essentially what he is saying here. It is superior, number one, to all worldly activities. So again, contrasting this to the last verse, where he's talking about material love. All right? He's saying that is love and illusion. He's saying that this bhakti is superior to that. And more, it's superior to any worldly activity that we can think of. It's superior to going to pizza machine. <laughs> it's superior to going to Disney World, to Disneyland. It's superior to going to the movies. It's superior to going to a bar. It's superior to, superior to whatever we can think of. Whatever worldly activities we can think of, do they not give people a little bit of happiness? Of course. Otherwise, why would people do these things? Why do people go to bars, Disneyland, etc., etc., etc.? Why do people do these things? Because it gives them a little something. It gives them a little rasa, a little sweetness, a little something. But of course, it's temporary. It's illusory. It doesn't last. You have to go to another bar. You have to go to another adventure. You have to try something else, etc. So this bhakti being of the nature of eternality and being of the nature of the core essence of our very self, of our very Atman, it's something that, by default, is superior to anything that we can imagine doing or experiencing within the material context. That's number one. Number two, it is superior to philosophical knowledge. Interesting. Keep in mind, these gopis were not philosophers. These gopis were not great scholars. These were not people who you could necessarily go to them and ask, ask them about the deepest essence of Vedanta. They would probably just giggle at you but yet they were superior to the greatest Vedantist. They were superior to the greatest scholar. Why? Because of who they were within. Because they were experiencing something that even the greatest scholar could not experience. What the greatest philosopher, and that would be a Vedantist, what the greatest Vedantist thinks about, theorizes about, and knows theoretically and philosophically these young girls, the gopis, personified in their life and in their experience. See, a philosopher can talk about bhakti. These gopis were bhakti. They personified it. Thus, they were greater than any philosopher. Okay? And then finally, how superior to yoga? Well, what were these gopis in their previous life? Yell it out, please. What were they? Yogis. yogis. <laughs> they were yogis. They were on the path of yoga. And as they are sitting there in their meditation, in their perfect meditation, think about this. Having lived in the forest and practiced yoga, meditation, asanas, pranayama, yama, niyama, all of these things for who knows how many years, decades, there appears before them Rama who they have been meditating upon. They've been meditating upon God within their heart. Rama appears before them, and what happens? 
they achieved the perfection of yoga. At that point, they opened their eyes and now they are in true meditation in a loving relationship with what they have been meditating upon within their heart. You see, truthfully, it was at that moment that they opened their eyes and saw Rama that now they achieved perfect samadhi. Because now before them was the object of their meditation. And not just standing there neutrally and them looking on neutrally, but now springs forth from within their deepest essence, bhakti, devotion. Thus they achieve the perfection of yoga. But what happens to them in their next life? They become bigger, better, more improved yogis. They become gopis. Now, with that seed of bhakti having arisen in their heart in their previous lifetime, when they see Rama and they have now perfected yogi, yoga, now in their next life, that bhakti itself can come to fruition. And the yoga, interestingly, amazingly, is left behind. And they become what? Not yogis, again, to repeat myself, not yogis, not scholars, not great acharyas, not great gurus. They become little girls who personify that which is the highest, higher even than yoga, that which is the perfection of yoga, bhakti, devotion, pure shuddha bhakti, pure devotion. All right. One more verse, 26. Why is this the case? What was just said in the previous verse? Because devotional consciousness is the goal, the fruit of all such endeavors. You see what we were just saying. So, all activities within this world, all meaningful activities, obviously, all philosophical knowledge and endeavors, and even pursuing the path of yoga. All right? Bhakti is the goal of all such endeavors. That's why it's vastly superior. So again, this is what Narada himself is saying, not a nobody, the greatest of rishis, the greatest of rishis. He has been here since the beginning of time. He is the son of Brahma, the creator, the creator God. He is here now. That's, that's who this person is, Narada Muni. He traverses this material world and teaches people to this day. He is a, an acting guru. And he says this, not just anyone, not Swami so-and-so who just put out a new book. Swami so-and-so Ananda. No, this is Narada Muni saying this. That bhakti is the goal of everything, of philosophy, of yoga, of all endeavors. And it is. Again, you've heard me say this many times. Bhakti, this is why bhakti yoga is different from every other yoga in existence. Think of a yoga. Put any word in front of the word yoga. Kriya yoga, Raja yoga, Karma yoga, Jnana yoga, etc., 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 Alaya yoga, Kundalini yoga. Put any word that you want to in front of yoga. Bhakti yoga makes all of them disappear into dust. This is what Narada says. This is what Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita. This, was a, this is what all the Shastras say, all the scriptures. And why? Because every other yoga is an upaya. It is a means and a means alone. Whereas bhakti and bhakti yoga is also a means, but it's also in addition to being an upaya, a means, it's also an artha, the goal. You cannot say this about any other form of yoga. But bhakti, devotion, is the goal, as Narada himself says. Thus, this is why we practice bhakti. It's with the goal of attaining bhakti, and eventually shuddha bhakti, pure devotion. Thus, the gopis are our greatest gurus. They are our greatest example. They show us that our station in life means nothing. They show us that we may be a great philosopher, we may not be a great philosopher. They show us that we may be the greatest yogi able to be in Padmasana for 10 hours at a time, 
do the greatest headstand, etc., etc., or we may not be able to do asanas. They show us that our class does not matter, our age does not matter. What matters is one thing. Can we love God purely, unconditionally, effortlessly, selflessly? If we can do that, we are the greatest of all. Thus, let us be like the gopis. Good. Time. So, any questions about any of this? Mm -hmm. And um, when gopis, do they still um, do any of the typical things that yogis do, or were they more? I mean, since they were already with Krishna in person, did they still, you know, meditate in the traditional way, or did, were they more just? Any time with Krishna in person. Mm. Mm. They follow the Vedic culture as strictly as people in their position were expected to. So, of course, yes, they were vegetarians, you know, they went to temple, etc. Et they did puja, things like that. As far as practicing yoga in any sort of way, they did not. As far as meditation, they were born in meditation. And they were in meditation 24 hours a day, even when they were sleeping. But again, a normal, <laughs> a normal person looking at them wouldn't know. They would just see girls milking cows, walking through the groves of the forest and singing to themselves. They would see these girls always happy. They would see them picking flowers, putting flowers in each other's hair. That's what a normal person would see, not understanding that internally they were in perfect samadhi at all times. But what does that mean, perfect samadhi? It means that at all times, in front of their eyes, they saw Krishna and only Krishna. It means that even as you were speaking to them, they heard you, but they were also hearing Krishna. It meant that they were smelling the scent of Krishna. It meant that all their senses were engaged in Krishna 24 hours a day. It meant that when they closed their eyes, Krishna was there. It meant that when they slept, they dreamt about Krishna. They were in perfect samadhi, focusing on God in meditation 24 hours a day. But no, they didn't sit in Padmasana and meditate. But would you say they would prefer to see Krishna's avatar when, you know, versus the samadhi? You know, you know, would they prefer to see Krishna's avatar in person over a samadhi? That was samadhi. Oh. That is samadhi. Okay. Yeah, that is samadhi. Yeah, again, unfortunately, people have a misconception of what is meant by samadhi. People think of some yogi with, with his eyes closed in trance. Oh, I, I can't stand that word. And a long time ago, it was normal to translate the word samadhi as trance. You know, it makes you think of like some sort of medium with a turban on, you know, communing with the afterlife or something, you know, going into a trance. No, that's not what samadhi means. This is why the idea of samadhi is that, no, in perfect samadhi, you are engaged in the world. I've talked about this many times. You're talking to people, you're doing things. A person looking upon you would just say, oh, this is someone just doing normal things. He's eating, he's sleeping. Oh, yes, you know, the, the guru is sleeping now. Oh. Not understanding what's happening within, not understanding that just in the same way that you can see the tip of an iceberg and, and not understand that you're seeing 5% of what in actuality is something so massive that if you saw it, it would scare you and how big and great it is. When you see someone in samadhi, you're just seeing the surface. You have no idea the infinite depths of experience that are occurring deep within that person. At all times, they're focusing on the divine, even even when it seems that they're not. Even when they were sleeping or, or you know, at home, it didn't matter to them, you know, if they were there in samadhi versus seeing Krishna's avatar. Well, they would prefer to be with Krishna, but they were always in samadhi. Yeah. If that's what you're asking. Okay, yes, yes, they always preferred to be with Krishna. But that was, that, was, that was not a matter of distance, that was a matter of depth. 
depth of experience, if that makes sense. It was not a matter of, oh, Krishna is not here now. No, Krishna was always with them. But it's a matter of, you know, the more, pro the more what? Upasana. The more proximity you have with that which is the center locus of the avatar Krishna, then the more depthful is your experience of Krishna. If that makes sense. Yeah. Very good. In fact, uh, mm -hmm. is, uh, in the books I read uh, during Ras Leela, even though Krishna was with Radha and they were dancing, every gopi, 108 of them, thought that Krishna was with them. Because mm -hmm. there was so much engrossed that it was just, none of them thought that Krishna was only with Radha. All 108 of them thought, oh, he's with me, he's with me. That was their mm -hmm. depth of love. I don't know how. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's amazing. But yes, that, that is the story. That And they even will depict that, that you'll see the Rasa Lila dance, and it's like Krishna is with each of the gopis. But that was really the level of their consciousness, such that they felt that Krishna was always with them. So even in that Rasa Lila dance, even though Radha and Krishna were in the center dancing, and the gopis were dancing around them, each gopi felt that, no, Krishna is with me. Krishna is dancing with me, and with me alone, in fact. <laughs> That, but that was the nature of the samadhi, that Krishna is always with them, in their consciousness. Yeah, yeah, that is another important aspect of the rasa lila. Yeah, this rasa lila is amazing, absolutely amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's it's very symbolic, but it's it was something real that happened. And uh, yeah, the the meaning of it is so deep that. If we can meditate upon and fully understand and experience the meaning of Rasa Lila, we understand it all. We understand God and our relationship with God. And that's what they call Bhava. You, you just mm -hmm. get dissolved in that very feeling of mm -hmm. Krishna consciousness. Yeah. Uh, that's, I don't know how to translate that in English. Yeah. Bhava is the... Yeah, the, the, ex the experience of love. Yeah, experience of spiritual love. Yeah, yeah, that's what it's like. This is Shuddha Bhakti. This is pure devotion, to the point where it becomes an over, uh, it becomes an overpowering experience. And there are not just conceptually, but there are even many stories to show this. There are instances of the gopis being so overwhelmed with the ecstasy of being in Krishna's presence, and sometimes even being away from Krishna, love in separation, to the point where they will literally faint and go into a swoon of samadhi. What does it mean to be in samadhi in such a way that your love for God surpasses the capacity of your own soul to even experience that love? Spiritually, you faint. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. And then the implications of, of this, what does it mean for a soul to faint, a soul that always has awareness, always has consciousness, but yet it quote-unquote faints. What this means is simply that the experience of the love overwhelms the capacity even of Atman. And Atman has an almost infinite capacity. <laughs> Are we going deep enough? <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. That's why, as I said, these verses here form really we could say the, the, the core essence, the heart of the entire Narada Bhakti Sutras, talking about the gopis. What we just read is the most important part of the Narada Bhakti Sutras, and oh, well, we only touch the surface. Believe me, each one of these verses that we did today, we could talk about for months, not days, months. Any other questions? Maybe we'll take one more. Yes. Well, if uh, the the ultimate uh, purpose of life is to enter into this pure devotional consciousness, it seems that we uh, uh, we are taking a very roundabout path. Uh, it's one just wonders, or I wonder, um, why uh, why uh, are we forced to go through uh, uh, the experience of the world since we're going to come out of it eventually, and just focus on God. Mm. It seems like a torture. In a way it is. It's a torture in the way that a nightmare is a torture. 
Uh, that's the nature of illusion. When you're having a nightmare, it seems very real at the time, but then of course you do wake up from it and you realize it wasn't real. The word that you used is crucial. Forced. Why are we forced? We're not forced. That's the answer. You see, some of us choose not to even come to the material world and to fall into illusion. And to immediately, upon achieving individuation of consciousness, explore that consciousness in the right way, in an authentic way. It's exploring our authentic self and going directly to the spiritual realm and going directly to Vaikuntha and being with Krishna, being with Narayana. But then, yes, some of us choose illusion. So we're not forced. We are in this material world because this is what we chose. And, of course, this leads to the, the question, well, if we didn't have this choice, what would be the implication of that? We wouldn't be us. We would not be Atmans even. We would just be automatons. We would be things, objects. We would be that's rather than thou's. You know? And we don't want that. We want choice. We want freedom. If we didn't have the freedom to choose to do the wrong thing, we would really be non-existent because without freedom, we don't have consciousness. Freedom, free will, svakalpa, is one of the attributes of consciousness, without which consciousness itself could not be operative. It wouldn't be consciousness. So we have to have that free will. Again, you know, any object, you know, why, why can I do this with this thing and it doesn't protest? It does not have free will. It does not have consciousness. Whereas we, on the other hand, have free will, which is itself an attribute of consciousness. So we have to have that freedom. So some of us choose illusion. This is where we find ourselves. But the example is actually given in Scripture that in our sojourn within the material world, in our illusion, it is very much like a dream. And when we finally do achieve liberation, we view it as a dream. We understand that, oh, that was an interesting experience, but no, oh, it wasn't real. So right now it seems like torture, but that's our illusion. It's our illusion telling us we're being tortured in the same way that we're, when we're in the midst of that nightmare, we're being eaten by a tiger or something, and it's like torture, and oh my God, why is this happening? It seems so real, but the moment we wake up, oh, it's just a nightmare. Oh, that was unpleasant, but still, yeah, it was nothing. We understand that. That's what it's like being within this material realm, where, yes, it often is torture. We go through terrible experiences. We go through terrible e emotional pains. We go through f physical pains, obviously. We go through all kinds of strange situations that we can't understand with the people we find ourselves surrounded with. Some are our friends. Some hate us. Some are, sometimes we have good relationships, bad relationships. Sometimes our own family becomes almost like enemies. Sometimes, you know, just on and on and on, an infinite complexity of good and bad, good and bad that happens in this world. But ultimately, it's just a dream. But like the dream, it seems so real at the time. When you're in the midst of the dream, trust me, you think it's real. But then you wake up. Enlightenment, liberation, samadhi, it's waking up. Thus, again, they asked the Buddha, Sir, what are you? Are you a man? Are you a god? What are you? I am awake. What's his answer? I am awake. For me, unlike sadly for you, the dream is over. That's what I am. I'm awake. So that's why we're here. This is our goal, to become awake.